Last time we introduced the Video Brain, the very first personal computer to use a cartridge. Today we're going to try the various programs available for it right here on Vintage Geek. Just a quick reminder, if you like vintage technology and computers like the Video Brain, be sure to like and subscribe. It's going to help us a lot as we grow. And I would encourage you to go to our website where you can become a member. We've got all sorts of extra content for you and goodies as well. It's all at VintageGeek.com. As we covered last time, our Video Brain had a number of cartridges that came with the system. This was the first computer system to use cartridges, and I'd like to try some of these programs out just to see and get a feel for what the Video Brain can actually do. Now the first one I want to take a look at is a program called WordWise 2. And I'll be honest, when I first looked at the box for this, I kind of assumed that it was a word processing program, maybe something that you could use to type documents and that kind of thing. But it actually looks like it's an educational piece of software. It has three exercises to teach touch typing and a new program called Cypher, which is a two-player game. Let's put in the cartridge and see what it's all about. All right, so the first thing we've got here is we've got a menu, four different options. There's Key Learn, Skill Trainer, Speed Quiz, and Cypher. I'm going to go ahead and say that the Key Learn on this is going to be interesting because, as we've already discussed, the keyboard for the video brain is quite unique in itself. It's going to be a little bit interesting to try to touch type on this. And if I go with the Shift and 1, yeah, interesting. So there's a timer. We've got a whole bunch of letters on the screen, which I assume I'm going to have to just type to match. And the resolution changed. It looks narrower. Each row looks a little bit more squished than in the regular text. So that's interesting how they fit that in here. So if I start typing, E, I, oof, it's really hard to find the keys on this thing. Where are my home keys? It's really not doing good for my words per minute with the uh, way this keyboard is. You have to be very deliberate with the keystrokes. Uh, slash, where's that? And with the non-standard layout, I can't, is that an apostrophe? Oh, six words per minute. I am flying on this one. <laughs> Looks like we're going back to the menu now. How about the skill trainer? What does that do? All right, I guess this is more of the same. Try to be a little bit, oops, no, oh, wrong key. <laughs> I got slipped off the keys there. That apostrophe it looks like a full slash on the screen, which is a little bit uh, confusing. Oops, now I'm completely off. Messing up my accuracy as well as the time. Well, what happens after I finish all the text? Do I just have to let the timer expire or do I have to hit a key? There really isn't an enter key. I guess I just wait until the timer runs out. Ooh, now I'm really flying. Eight words per minute. Good stuff right here. Novel though. I mean, a touch typing program would have been brand new at the time. I can't imagine one that would have been earlier than this from 1977. So that's pretty cool. And uh, let's take a look at speed quiz really quick. Oh, now we've got uh, real words. Okay, I see where we're going here. I wonder if this is the first time these words were used in a typing tutorial. I seem to remember this from elementary school. Oops, that was a larger amount of space key than I anticipated. I think I'm several characters off now. Oh, so I guess it just repeats. You just have to do it as many times as you can, I guess. I notice it doesn't seem to have any kind of stats for accuracy either. <laughs> Still at eight words per minute. But okay, I see what they're doing here. Definitely would have been nice to have an accuracy figure though. I feel like that's super important for learning typing, especially when you don't know where the keys are. Let's try this novel game they touted in the manual. It's called Cypher. Okay, red team type, blue score, and red score. So this is a two-player game. Oh, there's the next key. Type, semicolon, key next, okay. Uh, okay, I've got a timer here. We've got a bunch of blanks. Oof, that sticky space bar is a problem. Nothing like a little tea sting to get your day started. I guess you're just supposed to keep typing. I'm not really sure. Never has a minute gone by so slowly. So it's no longer letting me type on the screen. I don't know what the semicolon's about at the beginning. I have no idea if this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I guess we'll see what happens when the timer runs out. Okay, so the time is zero and nothing is happening. The score is zero, so I assume that was not anything of what I was supposed to be doing. I'm just curious if they actually say something in the book about this. Players are divided into two teams, taking turns, one team at a time feeds a message to the video brain. The video brain takes the message and scrambles up the letters of every word. The opposite team must then decipher the real message and type it correctly on the TV screen. Oh, okay, so you type your samples and then you hit the next button. That's what I never did the first time. Looks like I have to type something in and then I have to hit next so it'll scramble it up. So let's uh, try something easy. And it said not to make words go from one line to the next, so I'll try to get to the next line here. Vintage geek jumble. And we'll hit next. Now is it going to scramble it? Okay, so semicolon. Still something that's missing here. Not sure how I got points for unscrambling a word that I had not typed in the first place. I did this process and it doesn't really seem to work that way. Let me just try a single word. Hit next. I just got 200 points just for typing the word vintage. Maybe I'm not supposed to put the semicolon first. Maybe I do it when I'm done. Ah, that's the key. The semicolon is when you're done typing, not at the beginning. That makes more sense. So if I answer this correctly, and I hit next, 
Yeah, 735 points. Well, that is clever. Good way to get two people involved and in learning how to type at the same time. I'm kind of impressed. Now let's try another program. Next up, we have a cartridge that we do not have a manual for. This is called VB-81 or Financier. This looks like it's gonna be right up my alley because it's full of mathematical formulas and what I assume is for finance preparation for the home and that kind of thing. So this may be a short run through or a long one, depending on how I do with my math skills today. So uh, let's see what we can do with this. The first thing it's saying here is enter function. We've got loan, save, ROI, calc, ACP, ACI. I don't know what all these acronyms mean. I know a few of them. I assume the loan one's gotta be like an amortization calculator or something. Do I just type the name of the function or are these mapped to something on the keyboard? I really don't know. I can try putting in some letters here and see what happens. Okay. I put in the letter L thinking that might go into loan. Now what's happened here is we've got a three part screen with different colors. There's a line in the center section then we've got an L with kind of an inverted L below it in the bottom. And I don't know what any of this means. Let's put in some numbers, I guess. How about one? I have no idea what I'm doing here. The bottom character at the very bottom is actually showing us whether we're uppercase or lowercase. So basically this is telling us if the shift is enabled. So if I hit shift, it'll go to lowercase or uppercase. All right, I figured one thing out, hooray. And in this case, as we discussed last time, the uppercase is actually the special functions or the numbers, in this case, on the keyboard. I assume that's what's happening here. Let's try to do some number entry. So we'll do like 78, and then I assume math symbols would apply. So 78 times, oh, that's interesting, kind of unusual. Again, there's really no enter key here. I'm not really sure what to do here. Do I hit run? No, that is actually the space, okay. Maybe next. Oh, syntax error, statement ignored. Well, that's more than I expected to get at this point. So what if I just type in loan and then I hit next? Oh, okay, payment equals, let's say 250. Okay, next. I must be interest, let's say 4%. Going back to pre-pandemic days here, folks. N, number of payments, just guessing. Say 72. F V. what would F V stand for? Final value, uh, let's say 35,000. Okay, well, it gave us a value of 62 and a half. I don't know what this little chart means at the top. It's pretty cool that it has a bar graph built into this thing. Any kind of additional text on the screen to tell me what's going on would be very helpful here. So I don't know what the 62 and a half comes from because we gave it the number of payments, the payment value, the final value, assuming that's what those acronyms mean, which I really don't know. If anyone out there is an expert on the video brain or has ever used this program, please sound off in the comments below. I'd actually really like to know how this program works, especially because it has a graph display, which is kind of impressive for 1977. Maybe somewhere we can find some documentation for this to make it work the way it's supposed to. Actually, it does appear that we do have the manual for this. I stand corrected. So now I should be able to tell what these variables actually stand for. I think what I did wrong in the loan program is that I didn't realize that the FV apparently stands for balloon payment, which would be the bulk payment that you'd make at the end of the loan. That's probably why this didn't work out the way that I thought it would. I'm gonna use one of their examples here. They probably have a sample that would translate a little bit easier. We're gonna use the AOL, which is according to the book, an add-on loan. So the add-on interest is 5%. The number of payments is 24, and then I'm gonna do the PV, which is the loan value. We're gonna put that at 500. Ah, and there we have it. Payment is $229.17, give or take. They go out to the uh, fifth decimal place, which is kind of cool. And we've got an entry on our bar graph that I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I assume that as you add to the formula, you're going to add bars to the graph. I'm uh, fairly impressed with this. The book is comprehensive. The reason I didn't find it the first time is because it's actually a little mini binder rather than actually fitting into the cartridge like the other ones. So there's a lot you could do with this. And I assume this would be pretty powerful back in that day to be able to do all these functions on your personal video brain computer. Pretty cool overall. The next cartridge I wanted to try was Video Artist. Unfortunately, this one will not load. When I put it into the Video Brain unit, everything looks like all the others, and I hit the master control button, but nothing happens. You just put in the cartridge and it goes back to the normal menu screen. So just to make sure, I did check the pins on the cartridge itself. I tried to put a little rubbing alcohol on a Q-tip and just kind of clean it up a little bit, just in case there was any grime on the contacts, just to give it the old Nintendo trick. 
but it really looked pretty clean to begin with and when I cleaned it, it still didn't make any difference. It's still not playing. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. I'm a little bit disappointed because the video artist looked like it would be some fun with this system. We'll have to come back to that another time and see if there's any other suggestions on how to get these cartridges to work properly. And finally, for the video brain, we have the program called Music Keyboard. It's actually called Music Teacher. Now, according to the book, it's going to teach us how to read and write music for the keyboard and to play it on the video brain. I did notice right off the bat that this particular cartridge came with a little card that has the music keyboard correlation between the notes and the actual keys on the video brain keyboard. Unfortunately, this is not an overlay like we've seen in some of the other systems where it would fit on top of the keys, but rather it's just a kind of reference card that I guess you can put above the keyboard so you can at least refer to it, which is going to make things a little bit challenging, I'm going to be honest, but uh, the keyboard itself is already challenging, so I guess it's not that much of a surprise. Let's see what we can do with this. First thing it says here is choose your key. We've got play and record or learn a song. That's key one and two. I guess since it's key number one, let's see what the play and record function does here. Well, it's a pretty impressive looking music staff there. We've got the treble clef and the bass clef represented. So I guess this is where I'm probably gonna be using the cheat sheet here. And we've got different musical notes that correlate to the different keys. So the middle row looks like all of the standard notes. It also looks like the Z key would be the record button and the apostrophe key is the note record button. So I don't know if that means that it's stopping the recording or you just don't want to do a recording. All right, so if I start putting notes in here, let's start with C and then we'll do E. To make things even worse, they actually have the G not on the G. It's one key over, which makes this even more confusing. The V key is going to switch between the lower and high register. Oh, okay, so it changes the color of the screen. That's kind of interesting. Okay, so high and low. Nice. Now if we want to play this, how would we do that? The T key apparently is the replay. Now it looks like I lost a note somewhere. I don't know if that means that it's playing it or not. It should be actually putting out sound as you put in the notes, but that doesn't seem to be happening. So I'm not sure, to be honest, if the actual audio output of the video brain works or not. The only output we have on this system is the RF output, which should include sound and video. We have all of the connections made, so theoretically, if it's putting out sound, it should be coming through both the television and through capture, but that does not seem to be happening. It seems like something is not working right. So after a little bit of experimentation with this, and a little bit more testing. It does seem like the video brain system is putting out some kind of audio that is proper for the game. It's just that it's so low and so buried in the sound of the RF itself that it's really hard to hear and you have to turn it up all the way on the television to hear. We've got a little sample of it. We've recorded just so you can get a feel for what it's like and show that it is working. but that's about all we can really put into this video. Now, talking about the program itself, this is pretty cool, and I didn't realize this until kind of experimenting more with it, that it is kind of a live keyboard situation. When you use the actual overlay and you're trying to put notes in, it's doing it in real time, and it is technically playing the audio, even though you can't hear it. What was kind of impressive to me is that it does keep track of the amount of time each note is held. So if I take a note and I hold the key for a minute, you can see that bar extend, the T bar, which is, I assume, the timing bar. Now, it doesn't look like you can go anything more than a whole note, but uh, you can vary the timing of the notes. So if I do some shorter presses here, you'll see like quarter notes or maybe a half note here or there, you know, really short presses. So it is kind of keeping track of the amount of time that you're holding each note, which is pretty cool and definitely fairly advanced for the time. It also has the capability of playing it back using that same timing. Now the playback wasn't perfect when I was able to hear the small snippets we were able to get but uh, it's still impressive nonetheless. And I do like the way that this looks visually, having the treble clef and the bass clef represented and all of your letters below it. It's kind of neat. Now let's see what the other option is in the menu. We also have the learn a song option. So now this looks exactly the same, other than the fact that we've got the cursor key, that little block showing at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. So this one you have to choose. You can press key four for one easy to play old song or else key five to hear row, row, row your boat. And there's a play along exercise. So if I hit key four. I don't know if I'm supposed to be playing along with this right now or if it's just showing me everything. D, B flat, B flat, A, F. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. 
Merrily, 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 this is Vintage Geek. This is a great example of how hard it is to play a music program without having sound. And of course the practice exercises in the book are actually written in the musical scale, which is going to be a bunch of translation on this music keyboard overlay. It would be really cool if we could actually get the sound output of the video brain to be proper, because this program actually looks like it's fairly powerful, but without being able to hear it properly, it's a little bit less useful. But I do like what they've done here overall. And again, I'm super impressed with the video brain system. System. All the capabilities they put into this in 1977 is really great. I'm super glad that we have this here in the museum. As always, thanks for watching. I would encourage you to like and subscribe. It's going to help us a lot as we grow our channel. And please consider becoming a Vintage Geek member if you like vintage tech and systems like the video brain. We've got all sorts of videos on the site, extra content, little code snippets for you here and there, and a whole lot more. It's all at our website at VintageGeek.com. Until next time, I'm Aaron, and this has been Vintage Geek.